Nigga like me, man. Oh, yeah. I love the game. Yeah, yeah. I love the hustle. Y'all know what time it is. You know what nigga got dope. You just tuned in to the most exclusive podcast in the city, in the state, out of space, in the space, in your face. I need a meal. Mogul moves only. Gotta make me a meal a day. See money it coming through. And I got a real, real special treat. Yeah. Yeah. Hey man, we gonna have a lot of time. <laughs> Good time today. We gonna get deep. We gonna keep it light. I got a real, real good friend here. Hey, hey. See money it coming, then money it going. So we gonna go up. Yeah. My mama she hit on my line and she say, baby, I got some bills to pay. Hey, hey. So I need a meal a day. Gotta get me a meal a day. Yo, 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 yo. You just tuned in to the most exclusive podcast, Mogul Moves, only with your boy. Big B the Mogul, aka Suge Diddy, aka Illuminati Jack, aka Big Thanos, aka Heaven on Earth, aka Sprint DMC, cause I'm faster than a run, aka Dry Rub Shawty, cause I'm good before the drip. I don't need no sauce. She did. And I got a heavy hitter with me, a great dear friend, a mentor. I've known him for a few years now, you know, almost a half decade if we wanna <laughs> you wanna put it out there like that. This is true. Um, somebody that's making major, major moves, very inspirational, very, 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 very strong man of faith. I have none other, Pastor Vinshard Dobbins, a.k.a. Pastor V. What's going on, man? Man, I don't even know whether to say hello because I was uh, about to do the woe in a minute. Oh, you know? was about to get it. <laughs> <laughs> that other uh, side came out. <laughs> and, and, and just before we get started, I just want to make sure to tell everybody, please make sure to go subscribe to my iTunes, Apple Music, uh, Spotify, Our Heart Radio. Please go subscribe. Listen to the podcast on there. Please share it. Make sure you comment it. Make sure you rate it. Also, you can watch this podcast on YouTube. Search Mogul Moves Only on there, please subscribe, please comment, please rate. Every week, I'm going to bring y'all, man, an amazing guest that I, I think is going to just bring a lot to you guys. So please continue to tune in. Remember, on Fridays, I do Cash App Fridays. So all those who subscribe get a chance to win a little bit of money from the mogul himself. So I had to get the business out the way. But back to it. So I got Pastor Vinshard Dobbins. I appreciate you for coming. Thank you for having me. I see a lot of going on, on on your social media. You and your wife has been very, very active, very, very um, informative, very, very encouraging. A little bit about that, man. Can you tell us about that ministry and what, what you all have going on online? Yes. Uh, it just it started from the ground up. <laughs> started from the bottom. Now we're here. No. <laughs> I saw social media as a way to really reach souls for Jesus Christ. Okay. A way to magnify God, a way to encourage people, to motivate them. I see a lot of people with so much great potential, mm -hmm. but the problem is we have this great potential, these what ifs, these dreams, but everybody's not performing at the level of their potential. And so we're just trying to bridge the gap between where we are and where we're going. And it's not a splice of God, it's all God, but we'll splice God in it. We don't want to overload you with it, but it's it's really a draw so that we might all glorify God. Okay. Okay, this sounds amazing. So like, and I just want to put a disclaimer out. Y'all probably hear some banging in the background because we are at Mogul Media Studios, and as y'all know- We building, baby. We, we building. You, we building. You know it's a man. Renovations is in full effect, so man, I appreciate I Please bear with me. You may hear it spir sporadically or periodically, but Mogul, Mogul Media Studios- so with the ministry, how did y'all come up with the concept? Like, like what was the aha moment that made y'all decide, like, let's do this? Wow. My wife and I will be married 16 years next month. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. I was attracted to a woman who really loved God. Okay. We started out ministering in the prisons. Okay. We weren't in prison. My wife says, you got to clarify. <laughs> we weren't in prison, but we had a heart for prisoners. So she was one of my students. I was an instructor. Okay. And I was teaching people how to go in and effectively minister in the prison. And so it went from prison ministry to Salvation Army to homeless ministry to churches from here, UK, Africa, and beyond. Oh, wow. And we just really try to make sure that we 
glorify God in all that we do, whether it be a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, so on and so forth. And I think preaching is not just about, you know, religion per se, quotation mark. It is really about motivating people and inspiring them to be their best self. Okay. And so that's how it spawned, and we just put it together, and it's still rolling. Okay, man, that's that's amazing. And I've really been seeing the work. Can you shout out your social media, where people can find you and your wife on, on social media? Absolutely. We're doing website work right now uh, for ChristyDobbins.com. Uh, but uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can find us on all three platforms. Uh, okay. Recently, of course, my new role, which we'll probably talk about later with pastoring uh, at the Potter's House of awesome. Dallas. Yeah, we're going to get to that. I've tried to focus more internal and just really promote my wife right now okay. so that I can learn all that I can to be the best pastor that I can be for Absolutely. God's glory. Okay. So with, with your wife, Instagram, do you want to shout out her Instagram? Are y'all putting the- Yes. All you have to do is go to Christy Dobbins. We're super simple. Okay. There you <laughs> I'm go. I'm Pastor Vinchard underscore Dobbins. And that's and D she, O B B I N S, right? D is in dog. O is an opportunity. B is in boy. B is a boy. I is in ink. N is in Nancy. S is in Sam. <laughs> hey, I encourage everybody to go, go check it out, man. It's definitely a blessing. Definitely some encouragement. Thank you. Just. Just some things that really motivate and help us get through our day to day life, man. And they're they're doing an awesome job, and we're gonna really get into a lot. I'm excited about this this podcast, man. This episode has been one of the ones I've been really, 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 wow. really, really looking forward to. Wow. Um, the concept of God, <clears throat> I, I believe that regardless if you believe in God or you say you don't believe in God, the, the issue or the question of God is always pressing on some, on somebody's heart and mind. Is it real? Is it not real? Can it be proven? Um, a lot of other things that people always talk about is a lot of people are detached. It's a lot of conspiracy theories around how churches are ran. Um, for those who never saw the, the executive side or the business side of church, people tend to see and look at church as a place where – Either it could be a place for to get help or it's a place where people are taken from them. Mm. And a lot of those I wanna really be able to shed light on sure. how the you know, how the church is ran and things of that nature and how you got into a ministry and why you wanna become a pastor. There's a lot of things that I wanna talk about. So we're gonna we kinda just get into it right now. So a little bit about about your background. So where you from? I was born in Waco, Texas. Ah, oh, the Chainsaw Massacre. You know where it's at, right? That's where it's known Waco, for. we ain't coming out. W-A-C-O. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you made it out. David Koresh, shout out. Just joking. <laughs> East Waco, which was the gutter gutter, That's is the, the gutter gutter. It's the, it's the bottom of the bottom. Uh, it's almost worse than South Dallas. It's just a truncated version oh, of man. it. Uh, Stella Maxi Projects, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what, what was your was your what was your upbringing like growing up in East West, East Waco? I'm very transparent, and if you and I, let me clarify on my wife's social media, her name is spelled like Christ with an I E, so Christ or Christy Dobbins. If you go to her page or mine, which is Vinchard V E N S H A R D, trust me, uh, it's only two, actually three of us in the world: me, my son, and someone who loved my name so much that they named their kid after wow. me. <laughs> In high school, before I ever had a kid. <laughs> yeah, okay. But if you go to any of our social media, we try to provide a real ministry, a down-to-earth human touch to all that is going on because we're just people. Some of my upbringing uh, was really more of a sort of background. I grew up in a home where there was physical and sexual abuse. I grew up in a home to where uh, my stepfather was in and out of prison, hence my earning, uh, burning to really go in and minister to people who are in prison. I learned how at seven or eight, how to take heroin. And, uh, he, they would teach me how to drop the packet in a, in a, in a pot of, uh, of water, half fill, shake it up a little bit. Don't let it stick. Then syringe it. And I would have to hold my stepfather's arm, uh, before school. If he could get that vein that day, and some of his friends shot up in their legs. Very sordid background. That's why I'm so grateful for who God is in my life. He was an alcoholic. Um, he had a lot of issues. But the crazy thing about that is I really loved him. Wow. Okay. And I thought outside of that, he was a cool guy. 
He was an ex-Vietnam vet. Uh, he had PTSD. There were a lot of different things in the 70s. Upper, I was born in the 70s, technically. I'm really uh, more of an 80s baby. You had, and I know this, you asked me, so it's a loaded question. Yeah, go ahead, no. Before we got into the crack cocaine era, there was an era where there was free base. There was an era where there was uh, heroin. It was really a strong thing that a lot of Vietnam vets would basically, their excuse was that it kept them alive in Vietnam. It was their modern day joint. It, yeah. was, their, it was their modern day U.S. version of opium. Mm. And so with all of that going on in one house, I'm like, LeBron, I shouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, some way, the Lord blessed us to make it out of that. My mother escaped with the clothes on her back um, one Thanksgiving morning. Wow. And uh, the rest is history. Do you ever um, talk to your stepfather or have any? The last time I saw him was in Waco County Jail. Wow. And uh, I recently thought he had passed away because I couldn't find him in the prison system. But I'm hearing, uh, and he would probably be 67, 68. So okay. uh, there is a, we're in the state of Texas for those who are international or in the U.S., where there's a geriatric unit uh, around Huntsville, Texas. That's for our prison fields, prison systems here in Texas. He was at a geriatric unit. And I would normally look it up to see if he was still in. And uh, he wasn't in. So I thought he had passed away. But I hear that he's out. So okay. I'm actually in search. This is a real life story. It's like real truth. <laughs> I'm a real person. I'm actually in search to find my stepfather and just throw my arms around him, let him know I love him. Do you think... And I don't want to derail too much, but since you brought the prison up, um, prison reform. Wow. You know, we, we, we send a lot of people. <laughs> Which one? The <laughs> new promise? Get, the old promise? And, and the thing is, is like we send people to jail who have addiction. We send them to in and out of facilities jail because they have mm. addiction. We treat a, we, like what they say, we treat a, a medical issue with a criminal Absolute. solution. Absolutely. How do you, do you have a, any ideas of being working in prisons and all that? Some things that you would look like to see reform? Oh, God. Uh, we don't have time in the show. Several days ago, or last weekend, my wife and I ministered in a prison. It's the hobby unit. Uh, there are 1,342 women. And one of the things that the women were talking to us about are like things like their mattress. So sometimes if they act out, maybe they take their mattress as a sign mm -hmm. of discipline. Uh, many of you probably seen 13. Uh, I've not, well, actually, I just recently saw it, but sometimes when I talk about prison, many people say, you need to see 13, so I finally had to go see okay. it. Uh, I, I could say so much about this subject. I don't think we really reform people, number one. Okay. Number two, they aren't really rehabilitated. Number three, we've taken a lot of education out of it. Number four, we're getting large sentences for no reason last weekend alone there were women who had 40 50 60 some of the women didn't even know when they were getting out and i understand maybe someone might be a death penalty advocate which i don't tend to think works because it just kills the person but it doesn't reform their society their friends and family and the people that affect it the other portion is i don't think the new prison reform bill is really it's, it's a result of collateral damage mm. What are we going to do about all of the people who were in prison who received huge <laughs> uh, gigantic sentences for crack cocaine, which is made by cocaine? It just it, it blows my mind. I, I, I could say so much. The last I, I'll bring it back to your question, which is about the medical portion. There are some stats that say 78 percent of people in prison struggle with mental illnesses. I believe I agree. I believe that. Now, if that's seven or eight out of ten, the seven or eight out of ten are affecting the other twenty percent, the other two out of ten in prison. Prison is not just about what we see gang fights and rape. There are real people in prison who read books, <laughs> who write stories, who have businesses, who have doctorates, who have MBAs, who have masters. There are real people in prison who have children, who knit, who have dogs, who farm. Interesting enough, you would ask this question because the privatization of prison, especially in the state of Texas in the 80s, brought massive income 
most of our small towns, for people who don't know here in Texas, would bid for a contract to get a prison in. Because if you get a prison in, that means you have now several hundred workers who can boost your economy. Mm. And so what that says is now you have a way to make money. Now, from a state perspective, that's one thing. But from a privatization perspective, I don't think that we should have private companies owning prisons. I agree. And now there's pr- prison companies are on the stock market. I could actually wow. invest in incarcerating somebody else for life. Okay, I'll pull back. <laughs> you asked, so I had to. No, you good. No, that was that's perfect. So would you invest in a, in a prison stock? From an economic perspective, it is probably one of the most profitable things you could ever do. But from a human soul perspective, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Okay. I would rather go in on the inside and try to decrease it. After 2013, now we're starting to see some slimmering down of 2.3 million people, some aspects as high as 2.5, almost to 3 million people who were incarcerated. That's insane in America. Okay. So, like, back to your, to your personal life. Yes, sir. So, when your mom left on Thanksgiving Day, how old were you? Wow. 10 years old. The, the, the... The 22nd version of the story is that my stepfather had beat up my sister so bad wow. in front of me, and he told me I was next. When he turned to me, she ran out the door. I called my sister my savior before I really met Jesus. I called my sister my savior. She runs out the door, so the attention now goes on her. He doesn't beat me. Uh, some relatives come down. They whisk us away to our father. I, I get to really meet and know my father at 10 years old. Wow. (laughs) And so we go from Waco, Texas to Santa Fe, New Mexico for six months or so. I didn't see my mother. I remember talking to her maybe two to three times on the phone. And everybody was praying that my mother would get away. And so one Thanksgiving morning, we were told that we were going to meet my mother in West Texas. And so we went down to West Texas. My mother actually left with the clothes on her back, which nobody really thought she was going to leave. So it's like you're this 10-year-old little kid with an older brother, older sister, and you're having to meet or stay with a father that you, you don't really know. My father ends up being a great guy. And when I say great guy, my father used to play basketball for mm. San Antonio was the ABA back oh, then. Wow. He was a cool guy. He was a very intelligent guy. He was a laser technician at Los Alamos Lab. Los Alamos Lab in New Mexico is where we made the first uh, atomic bomb wow. <laughs> in the 40s. Nevertheless, so I, I meet my father, get to stay with him at 10. My mother leaves six months later with the clothes on her back. We get to reunite with my mother. About a year and a half later, my father passes when I was 12. Wow. Of a massive heart attack at 35 years old. Oh, wow. So hence spawns my relationship with God. I'm looking for a father. I don't understand my mother. And, and the story's not over. Uh, the last 15-second journey of this story would be that my mother had this at the time. I love my mother. She's a great woman of God now. But at the time, she had this proclivity to bad boys. Come on, sisters, y'all. I, I wish y'all could chime in. <laughs> you, you have this proclivity to bad boys. They're either on cocaine or heroin or they, they got to be rough and tough. They got to beat you or they got to take advantage of your family. And hence, it spawned more relationships. So it wasn't just my stepfather. It was the brokenness on the inside of my mother. Wow. That's my story. That's part of my no, story. Hey, I, I want to keep. I want to keep going. So, with so twelve. So you pretty much your adolescent life was kind of seeing your mom kind of in and out of what we. I guess we could say kind of toxic relationships a little Extremely bit. Extremely toxic. So, what was your journey and your path along running parallel with, parallel with your mother's life? What was your journey like going through like middle school and high school and <laughs> and things of that nature? What type of kid did you see yourself? I mean, yourself was I guess. The interesting thing is uh, I was, they call they, my friends used to nickname me the ghetto nerd. <laughs> I love reading. I love books. Sports became my high. Okay. Sports became my heroin. Sports and books. Sports and education. Okay. And by the time I was 13, my mother got into another relationship. She, had, she was in multiple relationships. So by the time I'm 13, the beginning of middle school, junior high school, I, I saw my mother in less and less. 
By the time I'm 14, my mother is staying across town with her boyfriend. And I have my own apartment ever since 14 years old. Wow. My older brother, my well, my older sister, um, she ends up being in our family, the first person in terms of teenage pregnancy. So she moves off with her boyfriend at the time, who, okay. be, who was a dope dealer. <laughs> this okay. is like a real life movie. <laughs> Um, then my older brother, he goes to prison. My older, when my older brother goes to prison at 17, I'm 14, or 14, 15. Then the older dope dealers, the OGs in the neighborhood, they say, hey, we're your little brother now. I'll never forget Young D. Young D, if you're out there, I love you. I haven't seen you in decades. He knocks on the door. He asked me if I was going to school that day. I said, nah, I don't think I'm going to school that day. Cause they had just got my brother the night before. It was just a very, just, I couldn't deal with it. And he said, you're my little brother now. And so how the apartment spawned is that my mother ended up getting an apartment for me and my brother, but she ended up staying with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So from 14 on, I have my own apartment. It's either social security from my father. Uh, my mother would check on me. Uh, my coaches looked out for me, and then local dope dealers looked out for me. Did you throw house parties? Like, did you turn up? You having... already know. Why did you? Oh, uh, you man, I was lit. trying to be the perfect angel today on the podcast. <laughs> I used to throw house parties from blocks and blocks. For those who don't know, when uh, we w left Santa Fe, moved to West Texas, it was a city called Kermit, Texas, then we moved to Odessa. It was the height of Odessa Permian, if you guys have seen the movie Friday Night Lights. Yeah, okay. That's my high school. Okay. And so basically, from being an athlete on varsity, we threw block parties, become block parties, become uh, it was. But did, was you throwing parties in an apartment? In an, in the apartment. Wow. That was... From that apartment, when I say block parties, what I'm saying is the apartments were so small, uh, you got gotcha. like hundreds of teenagers just outside. No, that would be terrible. It, <laughs> it couldn't let me. <laughs> that thing would be a Detroit. Let me have. <laughs> It probably people get killed. It'd be everything just reckless in there. And uh, and and by the way, at at fifteen, I didn't now have a living girlfriend. Oh wow! My story's not my story's not perfect. By the time I'm eighteen, I have my first son. Nineteen, my second son. Okay. But that girlfriend who who I did not marry, um, I respect her, and. Um, my older two sons are not by my wife. Okay. Everybody sees it like this oldest perfect looking family. You know, we had to work hard to get that. I love my sons and I'll always, you know, try to be there for them. But we lived together from 15. Okay. So instinctively, I was looking for a mother in her and she had issues of which I won't necessarily talk about. She's not here right. with her father. So she was looking for a father and that became how we played house. Uh, I got you. At 17, my She's pregnant with my son. I go to church. A rival athlete invites me to church. And uh, I say, God, I can't do this. I don't know what to do with a kid. So let's say, so let's say get ready to segue into the, the, the church phase. Um, but before we get there, I know you said sports was your, 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 um, your addiction, I guess, yeah. your drug. Uh, what, what sport were you into? Football, basketball, and track. Played a little baseball when I was young, but football, basketball, and track. Now, were you able to do anything outside of high school or college with track or anything on any sports? Yes. Um, I had meager scholarships in each one. Okay. I chose track and field because I had knee surgery. Okay. And so uh, you guys have the better technology these days. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Back then they were draining out my, uh, my the fluid out of my knee so I could play, you know, I had a few of those. You, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Wide receiver safety. Uh, I love to dunk on people, you know. And you still dunk? Uh, all day long. Okay. We're going to put you to the test. All day that. long. And in the 40 club dunking. Oh, 40 club. Okay. <laughs> so they're light, they're light layups, but I hit the rim. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all that matters. I don't think I can hit the bottom net. That's about <laughs> it. Um, so let's, let's get into like the, start getting into like the, the faith side of everything. Sure, sure. After all your bringing, I, and I guess it's probably uh, kind of cliche question, I guess. But after all you've been through, what made you? Why become a pastor? Mm. I don't think being a pastor is something that you say, "Hey, I'm going to be a pastor." I'm leery of people who put pastoring as a goal okay. early on. Pastoring some is mostly most times something that's thrust upon you. Mm -hmm. 
is something that you feel called to. It's a yearning and it is a need because really to pastor means you're really guarding and girding up God's sheep. You're guarding mm. God's sheep from wolves. <laughs> mm. uh, spiritual world, I would say the devil, uh, satanic work. You're girding the sheep up with teaching and information. You're literally laying down your life for not just one person, but a whole group or community. Okay. Uh, the word pastoring has to do with serving. It means you have to have a servant's heart. And so for me, it was prophesied to me. It was told to me. But I think it's something that you matriculate into. It's not something where you say, hey, I want to go to the NFL and then I begin to just work hard from here. There's almost like this snowball effect. The snowball, the, the, the light flurries of snow never knew that it would actually turn into a huge snowball at the bottom of a hill. But it right. was accumulation of all the snow and the work that it took place before so at, w- at what point, you said you was prophesied on, I mean prophesied too about becoming a pastor, hearing the voice of God or, or having that discernment or that yearning, I guess, the yearning. Yeah. How did you definitely know like this was it? Gotcha. Like, how did you not know gotcha. like, at that moment it was just maybe just an emotion because you are overwhelmed just, just a feeling of wanting to start? I promise I'm going to give y'all some some great stories later. But for me, this is real life. I get a track scholarship to Missouri Valley College. Um, back then, they were given half scholarships. I had a half scholarship at like Texas Tech, Baylor. I'd initially signed with a junior college, or we call it the JUCO. Yep. And I said, you know, my grades are here. So I end up going to Missouri Valley College, four-year school. I get to college, and I'm going to church. And I invite a friend of mine to church. And um, it took me years for him to actually come to church with me. So he comes to church with me. He gives his life to the Lord. Well, two weeks later, his mother shoots and kills him. Wow. His mother's in prison to this day. Literally to this day. Dennis Banks uh, was my friend. His mother was Mary Banks. Uh, She's still in prison. I believe it's Chillicothe, Missouri. You can look this information up. And what hit me is that normally I would have been with him at his mother's house. And it dawned on me. People have been prophesying to me. They've been telling me I'm going to pastor. But this is really it. This is my calling. I felt like God saved me from being in the room with him and shot with him to do his work. That's the eye-opening moment for me. I had to speak at his funeral at 21 And um, I'd I'd been speaking in the prisons at 19, 20 or around 20. But that was the real moment to say, this is a gut check. This is what you're called to do. This is what God saved you to do. Okay. So then let's start going a little bit deeper. So let's get on the topic of God, right? Yeah. So um, as you know, oh, we got two minutes. So hold hold on one second. So you can just go ahead and stop it and restart it. And then we'll come up since we. Because I think that would be a good point to. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the concept of God. Uh, You know, uh, with modern technology and medical advances, a lot of scholars and a lot of people believe that the thought of God is primitive. It's a primitive construct. Yeah, using the past only explain things we had no explanation. Um, too, hence like Thor, the god of thunder. Vikings really thought Thor was a god that created thunder, but science have explained how thunder and lightning happens. So now that kind of debunks necessarily. A god of thunder so how what do you think about that or how would you respond to that i can see why any person doesn't have to be a scientist would say that god is not real to them i can see i i can i can certainly understand i'm not even here to knock the people who don't believe in god but i'm i'm also here to challenge the thought of it because out of all the lowercase gods the g-o-d-s uh you know, you had, they would say the cow God, the moon God, mm. so many different gods. The true and living God is the true explanation of how any cell with a molecule, proton, electron, neutron, can fully come together through his breath and actually create life. As bright and as intelligent as we 
been over the decades and the centuries, no one has been able to figure out how in the world was man actually formed. And every story in the Bible has particular artifacts, whether it's the Ark of the Covenant, where it was eventually lost, uh, but some believe it, it was recovered, or some believe it's in certain places, or whether it was Noah's Ark, mm. whether it was Aaron's rod, the butter, whether it was the Ten Commandments. These things, are artifacts, have been found over decades and proved over and over and over again. The craziest thing is that the Bible is the greatest love story, but it's also the all-time bestseller in centuries. Mm-hmm. And I think the the last thing I would say is in terms of uh, we're more in a millennial control movement and age. And one of the number one questions that I get from most millennials, I'm a little bit older than you guys, is about relationships. Mm-hmm. And I think we struggle with relationships because we don't really understand that until we build a relationship with God, it won't help us extend outside of ourselves to actually build true relationships with ourselves and with other people. And I think once relationship building happens with God, once we really seek him, because that's my challenge for you to seek, to ask God, Lord, if you're really real, reveal yourself. If there, God, if you're real, reveal yourself. And I think that's what's happened with a lot of people, whether it's myself, whether it's a pastor, preacher, or those who are Christians, God revealed himself to them. You can't really just teach God. He has to be revealed. Okay. So let's say you, know, you have, for example, you have Stephen Hawkins, mm-hmm. um, probably one of the world most renowned um, physicists, yeah. scientists. Ever. Bright mind. Bright mind. And uh, before he died, he did this whole, I don't know if you saw it or read it, he did like this whole dissertation in, a, in a, the probability if God exists. Mm-hmm. And his dissertation, he was like, you know, he was told all his life from his disease that this disease that he contracted must have been a curse from God. But he said, no, but science says that this is why this happened, that Mm. this is not a curse from God. It's just a a genetic cause that happened. Um, He he did these probabilities and pretty much his probability, he was saying that there's no way God exists. Can, can, is there any way? Is there any way to tangibly prove God? Yeah, I, I think um, most people rule out, subtract, make God minute because of hurt, because of pain, and because of misunderstanding. It's all by faith. Okay. I can literally say I have never seen God. Okay. However, I can say with an assurance that I've seen God in you. Okay. I saw, with you, I saw how you walked with your wife through tough situations. I've seen how you love people in the corporate space where we used to work. And so I think we keep looking outside of ourselves for God when he's trying to really reveal who he is through us. Mm. And it has to do with faith. This is not where I, you know, take my new toy and say, hey, here's God. You know, right. hey, I got a God in my pocket. Here, here's God. You know, and there's new concepts. Hey, you know, we're all kings, you know, and I get it, you know, kings and queens. But then there's this, oh, goddess, goddess, you know. Well, if he's billions of goddess, then how is he really ruling the entire world? I think God shot the first three-pointer, man, which is why Saturn has a ring around, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think God is so creative that he said, you know what, if I want iced tea, I'll I'll create Pluto, you know, which is like a ball of ice. I think he just super fragilistic, expialidocious. He's so dope that there's a craving for me to continue to find out more about who he is. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the frustration with most people is that they want a God that they can put in a box and he he's unsearchable. And I think we grow in God as we seek who he is. So if, it, if God is unsearchable, I guess, wouldn't that discourage a lot of people from it? It's like no matter how deep I get, I feel like I'm not. I just feel like I'm just drowning in the search. It's the balance of humility. It's like a mate, you know. Mm-hmm. 
you never really you you can say, oh, I know my weight, I know I know my spouse, or I know my girlfriend, I know my boyfriend, I, I know my mom. But there are different facets of that person that really intrigues you. I think it's more of a draw. We're built for a human challenge, hmm. not so much something that is predictable. Okay. So I want to get into the matter. You brought up the word faith. And then we're going to two Fs, faith and facts. Ah. Question, with, with facts, is facts absolute or is it subjective? If something is fact, is it absolutely absolute or subjective? It's tough to pick one because facts can be both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They can be subjective because you can go into the doctor and say, oh, she's got cancer. She's got cancer. She's got five years to live. My brother had cancer, by the way, and they told him, yeah, five years. And they later said, you have two years. And then God healed him of cancer. I say it was God healing him of cancer. So the fact is that they said he had cancer and it actually showed that on their scan or radar with, you know, whatever from your radiation, chemo, et cetera. And then one day he doesn't have cancer. Now, some would say, well, was it the medicine? Was it the process? No, because they said you had to take the medicine for X amount of days or mm -hmm. months or weeks to actually cure the cancer. And this is what I'm talking about, about the unsearchable, uh, unpredictable part of God. So the fact portion can be subjective. Now, some facts can be absolute. Like you, you may be in a certain relationship and you say this person keeps doing this the same way and they're toxic for me. Well, if you know every time you try to communicate with a person and they're mean, the fact is <laughs> that's a mean person. Yeah, absolutely. You might want to make a different decision. But as it relates to faith, faith is about coming to a visible experience and belief in your heart and in your mind of something that you can't necessarily see in a physical realm. But faith will always reveal itself. Okay. Uh, I have faith to know that I'm, after this, I'm going to see my wife and my son. Can faith be flawed? I don't think faith can be flawed. I think people are flawed, and some things are called faith that are not actually faith. Mm. Fear is the opposite. We, we normally would say that fear is the opposite of faith, but non-belief is the opposite of faith. I can't make anybody's mind believe that God is there or real but I can pray that God would reveal himself in their life. And then they themselves can have a deeper vision and a yearning for who he is and say, wow, there must be something to this thing. So prayer. Does prayer work? And the reason why I'm saying that does prayer work, because we see, you know, young black kids or young black men get killed in the streets. And we say, oh, we pray. Mm. Mm. Um, we see it happen again mm. and then we pray mm. and then it happens again and everybody say oh let's get together and we need to pray mm. does prayer work I think prayer works our methods are not working <laughs> okay so can the, you break down the methods for us? yeah the bible says watch and pray and many people just took the prayer part and to me that's just lazy Mm. Prayer is cool, but I can pray without talking. <laughs> right. I can communicate with God without even opening my lips. He knows what's on my heart. He knows what's hurting me. He knows what I want to change. But if I vote for a different person in office from a congressman perspective, from a political perspective, or a judge or president, it might start changing different things. If I protest, which is okay sometimes, if I write a letter to someone, that, that's okay as well. Um, if I use my power or influence to change somebody's um, perspective on how they see young black men, mm -hmm. that might change as well. I don't think it's just prayer alone that's going to change all that's going on in our country. There's some ownership that we have to take as African-Americans. Then there's another ownership from a police code perspective where they're not telling the truth. And I'm not saying that every police officer is this way, but some um, stations have withheld information for propaganda. Right. And it's hurt and it's hurt. It's hurt. And so we sometimes as a church, we say, oh, we just pray about it. Just pray about it. That's our way of saying I don't want to be 
involved and I'm afraid of the real answer. So becoming a pastor, so many religions or faiths out there. You know, you got major ones as Christianity is one. You have Islam. That's another. Uh, you have some that convert to Judaism. Mm-hmm. I see some of my, my homies, they black, they're Israelites now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got Hindu, Buddhist. With so many different faiths and religions out there, how, why Christianity? Yeah, I think the difference is, even within some of the ones you mentioned, uh, the Hebrew Israelites have a really deep uh, historical aspect. Even from studying, they they seem to be rising back up now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was really from the late 1700s, really beef in, in the 1800s. But you're seeing a growth of them because of the reduction of the nation of Islam mm-hmm. as Minister Louis Farrakhan gets older in age. Uh, you see different things from Hinduism, Confucius, and um, Islam, which I think was about 1625 when Muhammad writes the Quran. Mm-hmm. The Bible, the Bible is Christianity's manual. It's our playbook. The Bible is endless. The Bible is from the beginning. The craziest thing is out of all the religions that you mentioned, no other person got up and actually lived again other than Jesus Christ, of which the transition of Jesus ascending back into heaven, he left the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Christianity is a living religion, a living God. That's why earlier I mentioned the true and living God. Most other religions are really just based upon thought, Proverbs and some of the proverbs are wise. Some of them have great information, and some of them have different aspects of what they believe is the truth. But none of them actually have a living, breathing, moving God. Christianity is about love. It's about forgiveness. It's about family. It's about faith. It's about fun. Christianity is the only religion that says our mind should be to be like Jesus Christ. Okay, to be selfless. Uh, to be courageous. There are other things that he did other than just die on the cross. <laughs> right. Because, and the reason why I asked that, uh, two reasons why I asked that, is one is the concept of heaven and hell, which I'll touch on in a second. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is some believe that, you know, us being African Americans, that we inherited this religion via slavery that this religion was forced upon us from our slave masters uh, who you know, snatched us, raped us, pillaged us from our, our mm-hmm. land and put this religion on us without us able to really be able to read. And for those who were able to read, it's, you know, it's been um, proven that certain scriptures was taken out so that to keep the, the black male or the black person docile, um, how, how do you answer to, the, to those who look at Christianity and African-Americans who are Christians are accepting the religion of their slave masters? Yeah, I think we have to really go back to true research, uh, even from a fact perspective. From a fact perspective, you can't just go back to 1492 or the 1500s of slavery only in America. We have to take ownership and say even I've, I've – done missionary work in Africa. We enslaved ourselves in Africa. Uh, Slavery here was cruel. It was horrible. Uh, There was a great decadence in America. I get it. We had to first fight for being human. Then after fighting for being human, then we had to fight for rights. Then had to fight to vote and uh, from an economic perspective. So I get that from an African-American perspective, the Caucasian persuasion has not been good from a historical perspective. But if we go back to the roots, uh, which this is found, you can look at it in Acts chapter number eight. You can also look at it in the book of Genesis. Black people have long believed in Jesus way before America. Um, Africa is not just filled with an Islamic faith, as many would say. Africa has deep roots of Jesus (laughs) from Jerusalem to Jesus going to Africa for two years as a baby. We have deep historical roots that that really date back to this is not about an American thing. Hmm. But within Christianity, there is forgiveness. There is love. 
I just think we have to take some ownership um, as people of color to be honest with ourselves that this is a cheap way to just blame white America for the plight that we're in that had that was great degradation and I I don't like it you know right. some things I can watch it'll make my skin boil I get it but Christianity um, from a slave master's perspective to where the slave master <laughs> Jesus it's the 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 it um the, the the slave master would do so many different things to our people and then read the bible and manipulate the bible it's not that the bible wasn't true but they would use it for their own good like slaves obey your masters mm. and what that was really translated into is submitting to someone who was over you unfortunately and that's our job as as people to break laws that that actually allow slavery to exist. Slavery is existing right now in some countries around the world, and we have to break that spirit. But that was a manipulation that they use uh, for their own wealth. I think that's deep. I think um, with I had a I had another question. It just it wasn't one that I wrote down, but now Take I just time. completely dropped it, man. But so let me come back to like my second part with religion and the concept of heaven or hell. And I feel like I, I broke this down with just, if you took the three major religions, let's say Christianity, Islam, and let's take Judaism or, or let's put the Israelites. They're not the major one, but I just put them there. If with just those three religions, I got a 66% chance of going to hell. <laughs> so, and the reason why I say that is Christianity says, um, believe that Jesus died for your sins, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and rose again, and you shall be saved. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Mm -hmm. Islam says that Allah, there is no God but, but Allah, and he has no son, and that if you do believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're condemned to hell <laughs> forever. Then you have the Israelites who believe that, sure, you can confess that Jesus is Savior, that's part of it, but it still doesn't discredit that you're supposed to live by the laws given by Moses. And if you're not living by the laws of Moses, you're not truly a follower of Christ because he himself followed those laws and therefore we're going to go to hell. So how I, I look at it like this. One, do you really believe that hell is does it, if it exists? And two, how would you answer to what I said? And this is a very loaded question. Sure. Or three, what if and this is just hypothetically, but let's say hell doesn't exist. Because I, I look at it like this. If hell, the concept of hell makes sense in a lot of ways to keep people to stay alive. Because obviously we was put here on this short time for a purpose. <laughs> if everybody knew that absolutely 100% there's a better place outside this world that everybody will go to, and everything would be love and peace, why would I stay here and struggle? Everybody would just off they self today <laughs> and say, forget this, I ain't gotta deal with this, I know heaven is over there, <laughs> boom. But then now you throw in this caveat of hell. And this caveat, caveat of hell, even to the most sacred, or the most deepest atheist, mm -hmm. to the most religious, or the most narrow walking person of faith, that little voice of hell in the back of your head is always there. Like, if I die, <laughs> what if I'm wrong? And so how do you, you navigate? How do, how do we know? Because like I said, if we just took those three religions that has a real strong heaven and hell concept, I mean, I guess hell is what try to make sure I stay alive like every day, do my best. <laughs> To stay because it's like, yo, you feel like it's a dangling carrot, huh? Yeah, this is like, man, because what if I'm wrong? What if my belief in Jesus is wrong and um, Muhammad was right? Or what if both our our concept of Christianity and Islam is wrong? And the Israel's was like, Jesus was like, yeah, you're supposed to believe in me, but I, I followed these laws and you're supposed to follow these laws. You really thought you was gonna get here. Let's get into it. Let's let's navigate the waters of this deep cruise in the, on a ship. This voyage is about these religions not meeting the full expectation of human satisfaction. Hmm. The problem with 
most people not conceiving hell is that they believe that everything you have now you will have in the afterlife, mm. which is not true. Um, even from a Christian perspective, we would receive a glorified body. Mm -hmm. And so the other religions don't really speak of a fullness of an afterlife. They don't really believe in the fullness of heaven. This world is not our home. I'll prove it. You ever um, have a relative that passed away, but mm -hmm. you think about them often? Yeah. Now, it could be Stephen Hawkins or many others would say, well, that's because your mind has a certain memory and the cerebrum and the cerebellum and I sipped a lobe. It's just, it's firing sensors and they can remember the love that you felt or, or okay, so okay. So we can put a check mark there. Okay, I, I get that. Have you ever experienced the fact that you walk into a room and you say, man, it's like deja vu, like I've been here before, mm -hmm. which means your spirit was there before your body actually was. What I'm trying to say is there are things that happen outside of us to prove that we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. And because God breathed the breath of life into us, we have his spirit if we believe. And your spirit is the very thing that will live on in another life outside of the life that we live in. It's not that we like people just be, you know, some people we like, okay, Beyonce was like, oh, she's beautiful or you know, Alicia Keys, she's great, or, or J-Lo. But even beyond that, it's a personality that we like, whether it's the love, it's the heart for children, or whether it's uh, the monetary gifts that they give for certain causes. It's something on the inside of the person, or whether it's a Jay-Z or a P. Diddy. They're attracting us because their soul speaks to something that's on the inside of us. What I'm trying to say is this thing is deeper than just a flesh and blood aspect. There is a spiritual world which is realer than the world we live in that, our, that all of our spirits are craving go, to go toward. The new concept is, is hell real. People are challenging when the Bible says the word Sheol. It, is it really real? You can look at the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation where you have the seven churches, the, you know, uh, the seven trumpets, the seven seals, and you look at the breakdown of how there's a progression this battle is about God fighting for you. Um, you got the battle of Armageddon. You know, we've talked mm -hmm. about some of this before. You got the battle of Armageddon. This is about God giving you a chance to say, if you just bow before me and worship me, I literally want nothing from you but faith, believing in me, and worship and glory and honor. Which, by the way, the Bible details how to love somebody how to connect, how to build business, how to make money, uh, how, to, how to have greater self-esteem. He says, I want nothing else from you but to be the best you that you can be. I seen one of, um, a guy named Shout. He go by Shout. He like, he's into like kind of a pan-African type of religion type thing. But he brought up a, a point that I, I never really thought of, and I, I kind of just want to pick your brain on this. Sure. He said... Because you say the Bible is about love and this is about a living God. Mm -hmm. And he was like, um, he said, in the Bible, Satan never killed anybody. He never killed anyone. It was God that killed everybody. <laughs> Even when he commissioned and allowed, I mean, Satan destroyed everything that Job had, it was still God who commissioned and gave his seal of approval to make that happen. How would you answer that? Oh, I love the question. I think the question is misguided by an understanding. The Bible says, our thoughts are not like his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, there's a total difference. And when we look at satanic rule and influence, Satan <laughs> is a deceiver. So the deception is for Satan to talk to you and go get you to kill somebody else mm -hmm. or to talk to you to get you to kill yourself or to commit suicide. It's a demonic influence to say, it's not me, that's deception, it's really you. Mm. So what you see in the Bible is a lot of people doing different things, Bible and real life right now, killing themselves or other people because of satanic influence. Mm. Now, the other portion in terms of like God killed people in the Bible, God's teaching principles and truths, but when he sends Jesus Christ, even if you were killed, 
you now have an opportunity to accept and receive Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ, people are like, what, what, happens, what happened during the three days? Jesus is preaching in hell to the people who never got to experience him. He went to the lower parts of hell to say, if you accept me, this won't be it. It's much more beyond this. Mm. And that's why we have to be careful that we just don't look at people as a failure here on earth because we're not sure what's happening after here. I'm not here to say who's going to heaven or who's going to hell. It's a basic belief in believing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, but it's going to be so much greater on the other side. This is a fallen world that we've created. <laughs> Absolutely. We've created this. I'll, I'll, I'll throw something just real brainy out here. Now, in the Bible, when God told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth, mm -hmm. if it's to replenish, re, that means to do again what was okay, here before. before. Absolutely. So before we, we transition and we get into the, the church phase, um, so a little bit about me is it's like um, I didn't grow up in a very religious household. Um, my mother, like I said, was a single mother of four boys. So she had to work all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, my brothers were so much older. My brothers around your age, they may be a little bit older. Like my brother, my oldest brother, he's 49. Oh, wow. My second brother's 48. Then my brother right before me, he's thir uh, 40, 42. And then one and my brother, Jimmy, 43. So, and, and my, my sister, 46. So like they all way older than I am. So, you know, when they in college, I'm in kindergarten. You know what I'm saying? So she went on as a child. Pretty <laughs> much. They were four. So church wasn't really a big mainstay in my household. Other than like I said, I remember having that big white family edition Bible with the gold gold trimming around the pages. <laughs> you know, saying that Jesus, you know the Jesus words because they was in red. And you had the all the like the the old like pictures, the mosaic type pictures throughout the Bible illustrating certain stories. So, you know, I used to be into that getting thinking somehow got stuck in Revelation. I don't know how I'm like 11, 12, trying to read all that. It was scaring the mess out of me. Um, then I saw this church on TV. I used to watch their little shows because they used to do like all these little end time plays. And I was scared out of my mind, but I was somehow like just draw to watch it. You know what I'm saying? They doing all this stuff about the Antichrist and all that. And I'm sitting there like shaking, watching them, but I can't turn the channel. And then um, I remember one time, you know, growing up in the inner city of Detroit, Detroit, you don't see white people. Usually if you did see white people, they were either junkies or they was cops. Wow. That's how we kind of looked at it. And then one day we heard all this noise coming from the park around the corner. So me and my friends, we went around the corner, and they had like one of those um, trailer um, flatbeds from a truck that was like a stage. Mm -hmm. And it was people up there like performing, doing songs. That was the first time I ever heard like gospel rap and all that stuff. So I'm like, they pass out these cards like, hey, if you want to come to church, let's fill out these cards and you can, you know, things of that nature. So we, we filled them out. We didn't know. This is probably like a Saturday. Then that Wednesday come, and a knock comes to the door. My mom opened the door, and then she looked at, she had this look on her face, and then she looked at me like, you want to go to church? I'm thinking I'm going with her, so I was like, yeah, okay, cool. She was like, well, they here to take you to church. And I went and looked in the door. It's a, a, like a 24-year-old white girl and a 24-year-old white guy like, hey, Derek, hey, Derek, you want to come to church with us? I'm sitting here like, look at my mom. You going to let me leave with these white people? <laughs> so then she, I walked down. I was looking. I was like, uh, and I looked out the door. And they had like this school. Our church colors was purple and gold. So they took, bought a whole bunch of school buses and painted them purple with gold letters. And they were sending out school buses all over the inner city of Detroit, mm -hmm. picking kids up. And Wednesday was our youth night. Wow. Because they brought kids, bus kids all over from all over the city into um, the church. And so then I got there. And I was like, man, this look familiar. Next thing I know, they was doing them plays, and it was that church that I saw on TV. I was like, oh, no, they had smoke coming up, <laughs> rock and roll. What would people think if they knew that I was a Jesus? <laughs> 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 I'm like, they got smoke coming out. I'm sitting here like, oh, the devil is so <laughs> uh, But, But I, I remember that night they did the altar call. And, and, you know, I went, I was like 13, 12, 13, I went and gave my life to, to the Lord. So, like, from 12 to 13, 12 all the way up, I was very big in church myself, going myself, got heavily involved. Well, my junior year, going into my senior year of high school, actually, summer going into my senior year of high school, kid from the inner city of Detroit, we're not into science, we're not watching Star Trek, we ain't building rockets outside, we 
listening mm-hmm. to music or hooping. Mm-hmm. 11 o'clock at night, bright, clear sky, full moon, stars twinkling. It may be like one or two little thin clouds. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the biggest vessel I ever saw in my life, like Independence Day, like huge. It didn't go, it wasn't like one of those things like, what's that up in the sky? It's like a little dot. No, this thing was like right over me and it sat there. And I couldn't imagine how like this fortress or city in the sky sat there, made no sound. Mm. No sound. It didn't like come and say, boom, and it peered over us. It didn't descend and peered over us. It went from clear sky to boom, right there. And at that moment, my entire world, my entire thought, was completely Mm. flipped upside down because everything that I know was now shaken. Because church ain't never tell me about this. I don't know anything. The only thing I ever saw in the sky was airplanes that can continue in order to stay in the sky, have to continuously move. But literally, this thing was massive and it sat there. And then it disappeared. It didn't take off. It didn't go boom, 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 out of here. It was just like here, gone. And so now my quest had been from then on technology in the Bible. What What, was that? What was it? And so then I start reading. And I look at things like Jonah in the belly of the whale or the fish. I, I mean, God can do whatever he want to do, but to me, that don't sound like a fish. I think Jonah didn't know any vehicle that could travel underwater. Hmm. That the, the, the belief that, I mean, again, disclaimer, God can do whatever he want to do, but logically, him getting swallowed by a giant fish and being in the stomach of a fish for three days and then getting dropped off where he's supposed to go, again, God can do what he want to do, and that's truly have to be a miracle. But what it sounded like, what it seemed like to me, looking at it from a technological stance, is possibly he was thrown off the ship. That there was a vehicle that was under the water mm. that picked him up that he was inside of for three days, and was dropped off where he was supposed to go. He didn't have no word for it. We have a word for vehicles that travel underwater now. We call them submarines. But had we never seen a submarine before, and you saw this big old vessel under the water, you can not call it nothing but a fish or a whale. Hmm. I looked at Elijah taking away in a fiery chariot. Again, God can do whatever he want to do. Mm-hmm. But a horse riding through the sky on fire and he just get behind a regular chariot and get carted off in the sky through space or through the atmosphere with a horse on fire running. Again, God can do whatever he want to do. But to me, what he's saying is a chariot, a vehicle came that lit up like fire and took Elijah. Mm. to me that made sense so let's talk about Moses and the burning bush Moses with light all he knew was fire gave light the sun gave light the moon gave light and the stars gave light however if you have some type of vehicle up here that shines a LED light over this bush this bush lit up like fire yet the fire did not consume the bush To me, it's like, wow, there's a technology there. He just couldn't explain it. It's no different if I showed up and put a light, a flashlight over a bush. It lit up like fire, but yet it was not consumed. Or the immaculate conception. Well, somebody can be a virgin right now and get pregnant. It's just something that was there was evolved and beyond technology or new understood technology and biology beyond their capability and was able to impregnate Mary, impregnate the seed that she carried this child. But because they couldn't explain it, I mean, that's just my take. But what? I, no, I, I love how you're thinking and what you're thinking. Um, Do you think God uses technology is what I'm saying? Do you think God or the angels? Because we created and we use technologies. Angels were created. Do you think they use technology? I think God is in us. And we use technology. Mm -hmm. And most times we perceive him as we are. Mm -hmm. We have the privilege of looking back, uh, which is dangerous, by the way, because now we're inserting submarine. 
mm-hmm. LED light or um, a chariot, you know, not, but it wasn't chariot. And that's what we kind of say in our heart. It was something that lit up. But that's us looking back over something that happened 2,000 plus years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's us just filling in the space, which makes a logical sense, but it, it doesn't take faith to just believe it. People would say, Sometimes when I tell the fullness of my story, I said, wait a minute, are you telling me you had your own apartment at 14 years old? Well, how, how did that happen? Well, I don't believe it. Uh, I've heard a lot of people in particular class to say, no, the ghetto cannot be that bad because mm-hmm. they didn't live in it. And so I would be careful there, um, even as it relates to marriage. You know, there are certain things that, you know, you can say there I've. I don't know if you've ever heard bathroom stories or bathtub stories mm. to where someone who took a bath before the woman who was in there, uh, whether it was a sperm cell, et cetera. Mm. And then that was something that has been told that that could overlay, mm. you know, an egg later on and somebody could be pregnant. I choose for me, I choose the faith aspect. Mm. However, the real thing I think that should, that would challenge you and that you would love is a book of revelation. And you talked about it. Uh, the book of Revelation, for, for a lot of people, we were taught not to read it. Like, oh, it's scary. It's not even scary. It's the most confirming thing that you've ever seen. Because mm-hmm. to your point, if you look at the Apostle John and he's talking about the beast, mm-hmm. well, how, and he's talking about what's to come, mm-hmm. the revelation that God revealed and showed him as it relates to the apocalyptic return and so the apocalypse and, and so many different things of, of Jesus return. But how else would you describe an airplane if you've never seen it? Exactly. It no. might look like, so like I'm you. okay with the forward thing. It's just the backward thinking. I think we have to be careful, but the forward thinking is he's, you're trying to describe something that you've never really tangible experienced before. So do you think extraterrestrials or life on other planets do it exist? Do you think I'll start with that? Do you think? Wow, I I wouldn't recommend this from a pastoral perspective, mm-hmm. but a Vinchard perspective. I absolutely, I absolutely think, and I don't know number one, but think and believe that there are other forms of organisms outside of the Earth. I believe that. Um, what they look like, I'm not sure. What about intelligent life? Uh, explain. So, you know, oh, well, I, think, I, I thought you was going very scientific when you said organism. When people well, say, like, it's maybe bacteria. No, what, or- what I mean is there could be monsters, et cetera. I'm not so much talking about that. But, like, it, you know there's a movement to go to Mars by mm-hmm. 2030. Uh, and they've already... See say, the recruit, I see the space, the astronauts, they already recruited as prepared yes, to go there. I believe it's lands for, and initially it was basically, it would cost you, uh, let's just say several billion dollars and you had to be picked. They were going to take four people to mm-hmm. Mars, but the issue is that you would not be able to come back. The first step is that they were going to send the satellites down there. Second step is the satellites would actually begin to plant plants so mm-hmm. that there would be different types of, uh, you know, plants give off right. oxygen, carbon dioxide, so on and so forth. So the kind of like a greenhouse effect. Fair. Yeah. But the four people who would be chosen from here would not be able to come back from Earth. So I said, uh, some, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> There's proven that, okay, there are chips of ice chips in terms of Mars so mm-hmm. that we, there could have been form, you know, here, there. That's why I brought up the aspect when God told Adam and Eve to replenish what was here before. So I'm not sure all that's outside of here. I actually even pose different questions to people who I highly respect to say, who would build the first church on Mars? Mm. If, if people if people begin to go to Mars, I'm already thinking from a Christian perspective, I think that we need to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is there so that they if they choose that, then they have an option to actually believe. So I don't know what's out there, but the the part of me is a deeper search like you to say something's going on. Because, you know, they um, what they estimate is like 300 some billion planets, something crazy like that. It's 400, four, uh, it's at least 400 other billion galaxies. And within them galaxies, the chances of us only, I guess this thing is this, you know how the Genesis said we was made after God on image, right? Yes. And on likeness. 
And what I take is that it's probably that maybe God, his own image is maybe we're bipedal. God is bipedal. We were built mm-hmm. in his structure. His likeness is to, to me, and maybe I'm misinterpreting this, is to have attributes like him. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why, hence, we try to be like Christ. Absolutely. I agree with you. So if God is, and I look at being in the studio, owning the studio, I look at artists, and I've never found a creator who only creates one thing. Never. I never found somebody who creates and has a passion for creating just stop at one thing. Do you feel like God is truly still <laughs> in the creating business? I think God has already created what he's going to create. And let me explain. This is the whole concept. It's the premise of creation. Day number one, God says, let there be light. Day number two, he creates the firmaments with the clouds. Day number three, he says, let the dry land appear. Day number four, uh, that's where the sun, the moon, the stars. Day number five, that's plants and animals. Day number six, man, where he breathes his breath into man. Mm-hmm. God breathed his breath into one man one time, mm-hmm. and the rest is history. You see billions of people who mm-hmm. have who live now and have lived before with one creative process. God is not sitting back saying, uh, hmm, now they're killing um, young black men, unarmed black men, so let me do this, let me do that. What God God has already created, what he's going to create. Mm-hmm. I think we're now discovering and walking into the fullness of it. That's mm-hmm. what meant in terms of the faith. So I think everything he was going to create, he's already created. Now, Jesus says, greater work shall you do because I'm going to my Father, mm-hmm. but I'm in you. That's mm-hmm. what the Holy Spirit is really about. Of really, I really wish we had time to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because mm-hmm. God wants to be fully in us, not just around us, but he wants to be inside of us. That's what him breathing his breath into us was mm-hmm. really all about. So you mentioned attributes. The key is, the Bible says, Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, mm-hmm. and the earth was without form of art, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, But it says the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. That first verse says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens have to do with the galaxy, so we have to slow it down and really meditate on that verse. Most people say, oh, it's just earth, it's just this. Well, no, no, let's because there are even religious people who mm-hmm. just say, oh, it's just earth, or... Well, I was taught in school that there are nine planets. There's much more beyond that. Within that one verse, there were so many different eons of things created because that's how creative God is, to your point. You said mm-hmm. you've never seen an artist who only creates one thing because we are ambidextrous in terms of our creative nature and concept. And that's, oh, I love it because that's the glory of God. Even in the worst person, that we might, society might say, this is a word. He's a killer. He's Charles Manson. He ever, even within that person. R. Kelly. No, I'm <laughs> oh, bad. Oh, oh that was a low blow. <laughs> no, right. Even as people vilify R. Kelly of if, if he did what he did, absolutely, definitely wrong. I wouldn't dare. I don't know it. You know, mm-hmm. now some, something's going on because mm-hmm. it, something, it keeps coming up. But even there's a childlike nature within the R. Kelly portion because if you look at deeper research, I'm told that then there was physical abuse, sexual abuse with him as well. So now he's reduplicating that behavior if that's what's going on there. Absolutely. My point is within what society says is the worst of people is there's this great person sometimes full of love. I started out by talking about my stepfather. Mm. Though he was this gangster type person, at the end of the day, there was love there in some aspects of his life. Everything God created, he said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Now, we take it from good to bad, Mm -hmm. but there is redemption in Christianity. We have an opportunity to believe that our sins could be forgiven, that he still loves us no matter what, because everything God created was essentially good. good. Good people can do bad things. Absolutely. We see that with guns all the time, right? So that's my take on that. Yeah. So uh, when we when we come to it, and I promise everybody we're going to get to the to the church in the orchestrating of the church or how to organize it is. But before we go that, can we, what is sin? Because mm. that, that's, that's a big thing, a concept. A lot of people, we look at life and I feel like sometimes religion 
our faith can, can cause anxiety mm-hmm. because it feel like every day is just a bunch of do's and don'ts. And when I don't, I'm screwed. And eternity is on its way to throw me into a fiery pit. It's about how it's about how it was served to you. If we go to a restaurant right now, if we go to McDonald's, hi, how may I help you? You know, it might be cool. We go to Chick Fil A, we're gonna get my pleasure. You know, right? But if we go to Three Forks, if we go to Nick and Sam's, these are for those who don't live here, nice palatial Absol- restaurants. Absolutely, we're gonna get top notch service. I think it's how Christianity was served. It depends on the upbringing or the church. Some people said, you're going to hell, 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 hell. You don't do, 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 do. As if they were perfect, which is, couldn't be further away from the truth. All of us are struggling to kill the flesh every day, of which the whole monument of Christianity is the difference between flesh and spirit. Mm -hmm. We often wrestle with flesh. If we go with the spirit, we're good. It's the spirit of God. We do good things. We follow God. Sin is simply disobeying God. It's disobeying God. Every day, <laughs> you're going to be faced with a different challenge. Some days you're going to do the right thing. Some days you're going to do the wrong thing. So being that brought up sin is, you know, it's disobeying God. So then I'm going to bring up my Israelite brothers who feel like we're not obeying the laws of Moses. That we took on this faith of I don't have to do none of the stuff just believe in Jesus and repent and that's good enough when Jesus himself followed the laws how is it that we are exempt from following those laws and a lot of people look at Apostle Paul as a culprit of creating possibly a, a false religion amongst Christianity because he pretty much made it okay to do do away with what yeah what you see here is the balance it needs to be balanced right mm. it's not oh hey let me just go kill a couple of people today i'm good god's forgiving me well yeah god can forgive you once you repent repentance means to do a 360 well a 180, 180. turn not so much a 360 because you're back at the same spot to fully turn what the apostle paul is the apostle paul was trying to say is listen I live Judaism. I live rule and regulation. That was by the letter, the law. It wasn't really by the spirit. And so Paul is trying to invite us into a deeper world to say, listen, this is about a faith walk. None of us will be perfect. There were not only 10 commandments. If you study them, it's probably 1,093 from, let's just say there are about 1,100 laws in general. Jesus even broke laws. He said, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, some of, my, some of your Christian fathers, wait, what are you talking about? Jesus did things on the Sabbath like heal. He mm-hmm. heals a man with a withered arm because the purpose wasn't about the law. The purpose was about what God was doing in the miracle. And so Jesus fulfilled the law. And I do believe that we should fulfill the law. I do believe that there's a certain way you govern yourself. But when you fall short, you have a God who's able to pick you up. If you, Your son, oh, man, it's a blessing. Like, I'm just watching. I knew you before, kid. Now you got a kid. Yep. If your kid does something wrong, like take a cookie, eat an extra cookie, you might want to discipline your child in a certain way, but you're not going to throw your child away because they made a mistake. You're going to bring them back and hug and love and talk to them about that consequence. And that's the other thing. Last thing I'll say is, not following the law has consequences. So a lot of things we say, oh, God did this, God did that. No, you did that yourself. I believe in ownership. You mm-hmm. know, you made that choice and that decision, and because you made it, there are repercussions that come with that. So like Ten Commandments, those, those are the most popular, the ten that we have. You know, that's an I steal, kill, uh, commit adultery, idolatry, what, uh, that's an I covet. Um, thou shalt not have no other God before me. Keep the day the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Mm-hmm. But majority of us in the faith of Christianity, we don't do the Sabbath. So, are we bound by these same Ten Commandments? Do we get to pick and choose because we we look at ourselves in a new covenant that we don't have to? How do we how do we answer that? I guess? Jesus came with a new covenant. Okay. He says, "Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul." It's two things I'm asking you. Then love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. 
there is a matriculation, a progression, a growth of just Ten Commandments. Mm. He said, thou shalt worship no other gods before me. And when he says, thou shalt worship no other gods before me, you see, that's the first thing he's saying. He says, don't put anything before me. And we can even put religion before him, mm. which is like your brother saying, oh, the laws, let's do this, let's do that, let's do that. But they themselves, even speaking the law, will have sin and a struggle with keeping that law. What, what's the biggest problem you see with religion? Hmm. Or, or, you know, a, a lot of people say, uh, I have a relationship. Yeah. So, self-righteousness. And, and again, I'm, I'm judging this to say that someone else is self-righteous, but self-righteousness to me. Um, oftentimes I get a righteous indignation that the Lord gives me when I can see somebody talking about how bad somebody else is and mm. what they did. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what they did was bad. But if you keep pointing outside of yourself with one finger, you got several fingers still pointing back at yourself. Mm. I believe in... Uh, you know, justice is justice. Absolutely. You know, if if someone did something horrible, broke in your house or burglary, et cetera, you, or, or did something to your loved one, you would want to see them being brought to justice. Absolutely. So I understand that aspect. But to the point to where I can't stand on a high horse and say, no, I've never I never did that. Even if it's not my particular sin, I know that I'm capable of falling short of the glory of God. So turn another cheek. Some people look at turning other cheek as a sign of weakness. Turning another cheek for, again, in the, from a black American perspective, was probably one of those messages used to keep people in slavery. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, that one scripture that's saying, slaves obey your master. Mm -hmm. um, so are we misinterpreting? Are, is, was Jesus really telling us to just really let somebody just come down and well on us and let us not do nothing, but just keep forgiving them? Are we misinterpreting that, that, that story or that, that message? I think the problem is that we harbinge or set up a monument or substratum on one scripture and we don't balance them all. Proverbs 11 one says a false balance is an abomination to God, but a just weight is his delight. And so sometimes what we do is we pick one scripture and say, mm. you should always turn to the other. Always turn. Well, there are other scriptures telling you in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for war. There's a time for peace. Mm. Which time is it? <laughs> you have to be led of the Lord. And I don't think if you're in an alley and someone's hitting you, God is telling you, just turn the other cheek and stay there. Turn the other cheek could actually mean turning and walking away from destruction. Mm not just turning and letting someone hit me. See, it's some, sometimes there are manipulation games that people use the scripture for their own good. Absolutely. Now, the scripture has to be used, and I'm not the one to say it should be interpreted this way or that way or this way, but let's look at I'm challenging. Let's look at it holistically and not just in a box. And Okay, so let's get with the, the, the Bible.